Now let me introduce our keynote speaker. He is Johann Swinnen. He was a professor of economics and director of the Lyco Center for Institutions and Economic Performance at the Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium. He is also the senior research fellow at the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, Belgium. And he also greatly assists our program, uh, the Policies, Institutions, and Markets program. So, Jo, welcome, and uh, we look forward to the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, I must uh, state for the record that I was invited, uh, Artavas contacted me a few uh, weeks ago and he heard I was going to be in Washington and he said, well, if you're in Washington, maybe you can present a report at the World Bank. I said, sure. I was expecting a small room in the World Bank as an informal lunch seminar. This is turning out a bit of a bigger event than I had anticipated. Um, as uh, was already mentioned by uh, Simeon, this is the draft. It's actually a draft report we're presenting. This is the second presentation on the report. And so these are the uh, background studies, which are mostly country studies, except for the one which focus on Russia, the role of Russia in Eurasian food security. Um, the, uh, so the architect of the project is really uh, Artavas Hakobian. Artavas is sitting over there. He'll be part of the panel. I'm also very happy that we have two IFRI researchers on the panel, because IFRI has launched quite a bit of very interesting research in the region over the past couple of years, and in particular the work by Katrina and by Camillion and several of their co-authors I think is really fascinating. It brings a lot of really needed research there, because one of the points I'm going to make in the presentation is essentially that there is relatively little hard information and relatively little good research done in that region. Okay, And so there's a lot of areas, a lot of room for improvement in that way. Um, <clears throat> I think my presentation will link up well, <coughs> excuse me, will link up well with a lot of the themes that have been addressed over the past two days here at PIM. I'm going to be talking about transformation, about value chains, about political economy, and about a number of other things. Um, <clears throat> I have given very strict guidelines in terms of timing, and what does the number, they don't seem to fit any of my constraints. Yes? I have 10 minutes left? Uh, okay. So the... Uh, uh, okay, good. So, <laughs> I have, to, as I said, this is the second time I'm present, making this draft presentation. The first time was in Moscow, okay, and where we focused in particularly on the key conclusions regarding food and nutrition security and in regarding uh, basically the political economy aspects. As this was a presentation in front of an audience where a lot of people were from the region, so they knew the region very well, uh, I focused mostly on these things. Here I'll start off with a bit of an overview of the region first to get a bit of a feeling for the people who are a bit less familiar, and then I'll go fairly quickly in the beginning on that, talking about agricultural transformation and uh, basically the transformation of the food system. And then I'll spend most of the time talking about food and nutrition security situation and the policies and the political economy around it. And I'll end up hopefully with a uh, few words on value chains and on uh, policy implications. Okay. So the key thing or a very important issue okay, is this is a very heterogeneous region. <clears throat> this is um, kind of all regions are heterogeneous, okay, but here I think it's quite exceptional in terms of the size of the countries. Some of them are very small, some of them are very large. Uh, income differences, I'll document that in a second. Poverty, food security situations are very different. The economic and particularly the political situation varies quite a bit. In terms of natural resources, some have a lot of land, some have hardly any arable land. Farm structures from very small to very large and also the trade situation. Uh, differs. So they're essentially linked to geography and their institutional history, and this of course makes it challenging. I think you can learn from comparative analysis because a lot of variation in the data, but of course it also uh, makes it challenging to draw general conclusions from it. Here are some data so to illustrate this. This is incomes in Central Asia, <clears throat> and so you see here this for the five Central Asian countries, and um, you see Kazakhstan is on top, then Turkmenistan is the second, and then the other ones are below it. You see there are huge differences in terms of income in these uh, regions, okay? And that will come back in the poverty numbers and the food security numbers. What you also see is that incomes since 2000 has been a big increase in incomes throughout the region. 
This is, these are indicators on remittances, and here you see, uh, again, a lot of variation. Russia and Kazakhstan are essentially at zero, meaning that most people come to work in Kazakhstan and Russia, but basically there's very few people in, who send back remittances. Countries, poorer countries like Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, it's huge. It's up to 50% of the GDP comes, from, comes through remittances from outside. This is another indicator of heterogeneity. It's their import dependency for staple foods. Countries like Russia, Kazakhstan are major exporters of grain on the world market and to their neighbors. And then you have countries like Armenia, Tajikistan, Georgia, who import more than 50% of their staple cereals. Okay? And obviously, this is going to affect the, the political economy and the, the optimal policy setting, etc. All right, let's take a quick look at the transformation of the agri-food system. <clears throat> Here are two indicators. They are the share of agriculture in the economy in terms of GDP and in terms of employment. And so what you see here, okay, is that <clears throat> there's been big transformation going on, particularly if you look at the GDP numbers. Um, the red line is from Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, this one. Is there a pointer? Mm, can't find. So the, <clears throat> the red line is from Kyrgyzstan. Okay, and you see it goes from above 35% to 15% essentially in a decade and a half. So it's a huge decline. And so all the pictures, the lines are relatively in the same, uh, basically the same pattern, except for Tajikistan. Tajikistan is the poorest country in the region. It has the least agricultural <laughs> land. Uh, and it's essentially, it's a very hilly, very mountainous country. And yet there you see employment, the official numbers pointed going from uh, roughly 50 to 80% of uh, people working in agriculture. So that's huge, okay? And obviously this is going to have um, different implications on the optimal strategies, optimal policy design there. You see, but even in the other countries, there are roughly around 30% of employment in those. So that's a lot. So agriculture is really important in, uh, <clears throat> for that reason. Here I put them in a comparative perspective, and you see roughly that I follow the same pattern, and that the negative relationship between the share of agriculture in GDP and uh, basically the level of GDP. And so the red, uh, the countries I circled red, are the countries of focus in this country, and the rest are other East European countries and Central Asian countries. If we look at production and productivity, here I think this is an interesting comparative uh, picture because Essentially, the top is production, and this starts at 1990. That's when the systematic transformations uh, started. And you see everywhere there was a significant fall in output. But uh, the key point to look at, I would say, is compare the green line with the red line. And the green line is Central Asia, which most of our countries are from. And the red line is Central Europe. So that's Hungary, Czech Republic, Poland, etc. Okay? And so what you see is that in, actually in Central Europe, you had a significant fall in output, and that stayed. Okay, it didn't come back. In Central Asia, it really recovered. There's a lot of growth in agriculture production. But if you look at the productivity indicators, you get the opposite picture. Okay, you see that productivity has grown a lot in uh, Central Europe, and basically it has rebounded a bit in Central Asia, but not tremendously. Okay. How has productivity change come about? This picture is, is this is actually copied from Chameleon, okay? So I saw it in one of his papers, and it's the famous Rutan uh, Hayami uh, model, if you want, looking at land productivity on the vertical axis and labor productivity on the horizontal axis. And so basically we put our countries in here. And what you see is that the growth in productivity that has taken place has gone through very different channels. You have Tajikistan, which is the most vertical line, okay, where you see significant growth, but it's essentially in land productivity. Then you have countries like the Kazakhstan here, which is the flat line at the bottom, the blue line, and there all the growth has come through uh, labor productivity. And the difference is, is this is very strongly correlated with farm structures. So basically on the law, the countries where large farms are dominating, there the growth is coming mostly to labor productivity, where small farms are dominating, it's coming through uh, land productivity growth. And this is essentially what, this is another picture that tells the same story. There you see there's a correlation between uh, the importance of smallholders in the agricultural system and uh, labor productivity across countries. Okay. All right, then let's take a look at food and nutrition security. So this slide kind of summarized four key uh, observations that come out of our study. 
What we've seen is that over the past 15 years, there's been, on average, a very strong improvement in terms of poverty reduction, undernourishment, and micronutrient deficiency. But micronutrient deficiencies remain serious problems, okay? So they have fallen a lot, and I'll document it in a second, but at, they're still at fairly high levels. And what seems to be uh, particularly troubling is anemia for women. There we find in several of the countries, actually, that, uh, that indicator has worsened, has increased since 2002. We also find large regional differences in uh, food and nutrition security, and they are kind of consistent with what you expect. So they're worse in rural areas than in urban areas, uh, etc. And we see an increasing challenge, which is overnutrition in the region. I'll document a couple of these things by, with numbers. Um, yes, the first one is, okay, what has caused these changes? Well, the main reason is income growth, okay? As I, I'll show you in a second, the correlation or some indicator of correlation between some of these indicators, <laughs> income growth. So income is coming directly from growth inside the countries and uh, also from uh, remittances of growth and remittances from countries like Russia and Kazakhstan, which have been doing well. And so what I'll show in a couple of slides is that in 2014, uh, the Russian sanctions were introduced and there was a decline in oil prices and as a result, income declined quite significantly in Russia and also to some extent in Kazakhstan, which spilled over in the other countries through the remittances channel. Price changes have, of course, had an impact, particularly food price crisis and policies uh, where we will be moving uh, next to. This is a uh, picture which basically, on the one hand, you see the same picture, but now a bit uh, more narrow, a strong income growth over the past uh, 15 years in the countries. And on the right panel, you see the decline in anemia among uh, children over uh, 25 years and you see there's been a very significant decline in anemia across the board but you also see that these are flattening out somewhere between 25 and 35 percent okay so it still remains high in all the countries essentially this is a table which roughly it basically has a number of other indicators and you see the change from 2002 uh, in the first column in the second column in the last column and everywhere you see uh, negative numbers uh, and significant negative numbers for a lot of the indicators, okay? Uh, here is a story on the remittances, which I told you. Here you see from 2010, so remittances go up. This is for three different countries, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Remittances go up from an index from 100 to uh, 200, roughly. And then after 2014, when the crisis hits, it basically falls uh, to... to 2015 and 2016 level picking up again in 2017 okay so these are these are important spillover effects within the region we have uh, these are data on obesity data among children okay for different age categories and you see that uh, the numbers are getting high even among children Russian Federation up to 25 percent but also in Kazakhstan Armenia close to 20 percent here again, if you look at it from a, a development perspective, you see that actually the countries in the region fit the, the broader global relationship between income and uh, obesity. So on the left-hand side, <clears throat> not on the left, on the vertical axis, you have obesity prevalence, okay? And the horizontal axis is income per capita. And <clears throat> so this kind of nonlinear growth trend in obesity, so the, the red countries are from Central and Eastern Europe, and the ones with the circles are our focus country, and they all kind of fit the pattern, right? So the only ones who don't are South Korea and, and Japan there. So. If you look at food prices and food security, <clears throat> we know that there's been a discussion to what extent food prices are basically uh, hurting poverty or helping poverty because they are beneficial for farmers who are usually the poorest people in society. So there's some really excellent papers now by Derek Heddy and by Derek and, and Will Martin, which kind of review all the evidence and come to the conclusion that on average, the 2007-2009 period actually reduced poverty rather than increasing it on average, but there's been big difference between households and regions, depending on whether they're net consumers or net producers of food. And these are data from, I see that the bottom is falling out, these are data from different provinces in Armenia, and here you can clearly see the impact of the food price increases. So these are data from 2005, 2010, 2016 for 10 different provinces or so, and you really see a big jump 
in childhood studying, stunting in 2010, and so this is probably due to the increase in food prices. Okay, so it does have a big impact there, negative. Okay, let's look at the policy um, framework then. So when we started this uh, project, <clears throat> and so when Artavas gave us our guidelines to start work, said, how is the impact of food and nutrition security policies on the situation there and some of the political economies? And of course, you have to define food and nutrition policies. And in a way, it's, it's kind of easy and hard at the same time, right? Now, we know that a lot of policies directly or indirectly affect food and nutrition security, of course. You have trade policies, macroeconomic policies, subsidies, um, social security. And I mean, I don't have to explain in IFPRI what policies are affecting food and nutrition security, right? Okay. The key thing is that there's limited quantitative indicators, okay? So, and that makes the analysis difficult, both from a comparative perspective, but also within the countries, okay? It's very hard. So this, one of the conclusions we draw at the end, we need to do much more work on collecting data on these things. <clears throat> So here's a couple of numbers that we have. This is public spending on social assistance programs. Uh, they are around uh, somewhere between half a percent and three percent, and Kyrgyzstan is standing out as the highest percentage uh, going to social assistance. What's interesting is that the poorest country, Tajikistan, has by far the lowest uh, spending on social assistance program. These are <clears throat> food safety policy indicators, which we found, and it's kind of, I was surprised by these numbers. So this is 2010 blue and 2017 red. And what you see <laughs> is that actually the W, uh, the World Health Organization considers these countries as being almost perfect in food safety implementation, which was surprising to me when I saw the numbers first. So it's uh, a bit of a question whether this is correct on paper or correct in terms of implementation. These are data on agricultural support. And so there are PSE numbers, but only for three countries. So this is from, um, the names have fallen off from the bottom. This is Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Okay, the three grain exporters who producers. And you see that they're actually roughly the same. They're around 10% the PSE levels, which means that farms are supported on average, but not much, okay, 10%. What we will see later in the presentation is that there's a lot of difference between specific commodities within agriculture, okay? So the average numbers are not so high, but some of the commodities are actually supported a lot and some are taxed quite a bit. If you look at the numbers in government spending on agriculture there, you see that Uzbekistan really stands out as at 10%, okay? So 10% of the government budget goes to agricultural uh, support or investments in research, et cetera, in general. And so you will find that uh, coming back that agriculture is a really important sector in Uzbekistan, also at the political level, et cetera. Okay, so then the more general food and nutrition security policies. So the countries have introduced a variety of these policies. And so in the report, they, the reports go in great detail documenting these, et cetera, mostly descriptive uh, documentations of the new, the, the legal, documents, the implementation, etc. okay? In several of the countries, this has been done in co collaboration with international organizations. The uh, country reports, it's a mixture of success stories and of problems of implementation. The success stories, for example, refer to programs which have been introduced to uh, iron deficiency reduction programs uh, through salt, to fortification of salt or floor, which has been implemented in most of the countries. There's been, there's also documentation of problems with that, and they have to do often with, um, there's actually two uh, main implementation problems. One is because of the capacity problems and expertise by the implementing bodies in the countries. And the other one is because there's a lot of home consumption of grain. And of course, if you have home consumption or basically grain being bought through inofficial channels, these are not addressed through these programs, okay? So we have double problems of implementation. The, um, yes, and then we have the several documentations in the reports of international programs and organizations trying to address some of these capacity and these expertise constraints. Okay, then the next thing I want to point out is that the, the issue of self-sufficiency in food is some, something which is really pertinent in the region. It's continuously emphasized in the policy debate and uh, so we spent quite a bit of time trying to identify to what extent this is just uh, politicians saying something or um, 
people, stakeholders uh, are emphasizing this or whether it's actually also introduced in the policies. And so the, um, we have listed, um, these are just examples of uh, policy documents or policy implementation, the legal, the laws, etc. And so we looked at how important self-sufficiency is uh, in this food security concept. And then we also looked at the role of nutrition okay, in the food security uh, strategies of the different countries. And so we now, uh, <laughs> in my time, you could still get papers published with 25 observations uh, and statistical analysis. I know this is now uh, past uh, history, but in any case, so I mean my time mean when I'm as a student, okay, not I'm still, my time is still going. So we kind of said, <laughs> we kind of said, let's take a look at uh, this. And so basically the nutrition focus we have from uh, less to more, and the self-sufficiency focus is also from less to more, okay? And so we see that there are two countries, which Kyrgyz, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Armenia, which have a relatively limited emphasis on, on self-sufficiency in their food security and a strong emphasis on nutrition. And then you have the countries like uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Russia, which are kind of the big agricultural countries, if you want, and they have a strong emphasis on self-sufficiency and very little emphasis on nutrition in the food security strategies, okay? And so I'll go into why that may be the case. But first, the point is this. I had this slide. I didn't know what Washington was the right place to put on, something about fake, uh, but <laughs> I did it anyhow. Uh, and so an issue which we find which is actually hard to figure out okay is that even if countries like for example russia do not emphasize nutrition in their food security strategy it doesn't mean they don't have nutrition policies but typically they're under the health ministry etc okay and so the, the reports have tried to deal with with that but it's really a problem of getting good indicators of the importance of nutrition in uh, food security strategies let's look at the Political economy, then, can we explain these patterns? I'm going to abuse this moment to point out that I've written a new book on the political economy of agriculture and food policies. It was published three months ago. And so uh, I think this is the right audience to point that out. <laughs> so these are issues uh, which are discussed, so political incentives, structural characteristics, um, external shocks and influences, decision-making institu institutions, uh, media, information systems, etc. Okay. So in the reports, in the studies, uh, people have tried to go into this, okay, and um, it's difficult. So let me f uh, just point you out one of the difficulties in doing this analysis. So who are the key agents and structure in decision making? These are two pictures, two figures from the reports. This is from Kazakhstan, where there's a very nice picture basically outlining the different decision making pro uh, procedures, the steps that have to go through all the institutions you have to go through. This one is a similar one from Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is only even more uh, complex. All the stakeholders who get consultant and things like that. But now let's look at something else. So these are data on political and media freedom. And what you see here is that basically media freedom has gone down in all the countries uh, in over the past decade particularly. And so it, be, it was low already in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. And it's only the red, uh, basically in Kyrgyzstan and Armenia, it's, it's highest, but it's still below 50% according to this indicator. And political freedom has gone down across the board in these countries, okay? And so the issue is, of course, for us, all right, so what does it mean that you have these complicated uh, consulting pr uh, procedures and, and, and decision-making institutions if it's maybe one person or one family who makes the decision, all right? Now, there's a whole literature, actually, on the impact of uh, political reforms of uh, dictatorship versus or autocracy versus, dicta versus democracy in terms of decision-making on public policy in general, on trade policy, and also on uh, agricultural policy. And it's very complex what the impact is, okay? We see, actually, similar patterns in agricultural protection over time both through under democracies and under uh, under democracies and under autocratic, uh, autocratic systems. So what we then did, okay, if we try to do is basically, I'm going to point out uh, something. I think we can say something about it, and it's two things. One is look at the history of these policy changes, and then at some current uh, cross-section policy variation where we do have indicators for. 
Okay, and so in terms of the history, there we see essentially three um, big events which have an impact on the policy. One is the falling apart of the Soviet Union, not surprising, the food crisis of 2007, and the Russian sanction 2014. And I'm going to do this briefly. I'm going to have one slide roughly on each. So what you see is that after the fall and the disintegration, right, that there's been a number of regional uh, institutions which have been started up with very limited success, actually. And so the last one is the Eurasian Economic Union. And so there, there's a lot of pressure, particularly from uh, Russia, to basically make this more active and basically have uh, more integrated collaboration, which has a big impact impact on trade policies potentially and thus on food security. <clears throat> okay, so this is what you see in Uzbekistan. Here you see very clearly after the, essentially this was one country, okay, and so one of the reasons why uh, self-sufficiency is so important is essentially because uh, the, they were basically, the moment the thing broke up, they were importing a lot of uh, wheat and or grains in this case, but they were important from their own country, which was the Soviet Union, okay? And so what you see is that in Uzbekistan, for example, the government has emphasized very strongly self-sufficiency, and there you've basically moved towards a higher production of wheat, okay, over the, in the 1990s, 2000s, and at the same time, you see cotton, which is the biggest export commodity of Uzbekistan, has fallen over this period. This picture documents a similar story for all the countries, and you see in the early years, 1990s, the ones which are significantly below zero, okay, they have emphasized a lot basically growing their own grain, essentially, in these countries. And even Armenia, which has relatively little emphasis on food security at the bottom line, has seen an increase in uh, self-sufficiency in those regions. Look at the history. This is a list of all the... Um, the food security policies in the region, and there you see uh, the key thing which has triggered this, okay, so this is a better term. So this is the, the, the gray uh, dot is which for each of the country when there was the first time a significant food security legislation in the country, and you clearly see the correlation with the food price spikes in that part of the world, okay. Russian uh, sanctions, I think there the key point is that Russia joined the, the, the WTO in 2012 and basically at that time it had to open up its market for a number of commodities and essentially Russia after the sanction in 2014, Russia has introduced counter sanctions and these counter sanctions are essentially targeted towards those commodities which basically the markets would have to be opened under the WTO. Okay, so it's kind of using the counter-sanction matters as a way to counter the WTO opening uh, its markets uh, role or effect. Okay, and therefore the food security is an element, the doctrine used actually for the emphasizing the food self-sufficiency argument. Okay, so um, I just have two more slides on this thing. One is on it's very puzzling, okay, that there's such a strong emphasis on self-sufficiency in those countries which are actually big exporters of grain, okay? And so we puzzled about this, and what we think is probably, the reason is probably that you look, should look beyond grains, okay? And if you look at all the agriculture products, then you see the red dots here, red lines are the exports, or the imports, sorry, the blue are the exports, then you see that almost, that all these countries are actually net importers of food. Okay. And if you disentangle or disaggregate the different products, and that's what we did with the PSE data, I'm just going to skip this one, with the PSE data for the countries where we have them from, there you see that there is a negative correlation between the protection level and basically the import uh, situation of the particular commodity. And this is consistent with Kim Anderson's uh, anti-trade bias of agriculture policy, which we observe in many countries in the world. Okay, uh, yes, and this one here is, <laughs> I've put this one together here because it's so striking, okay, that the focus on nutrition is so strong, at least in the legal documents, okay, in those countries which are where international donors are more influencing, okay? And so the question is, is it because the international donors are present, influencing the government to put that in their legislation, and that's why uh, this correlation may be there. Okay. The question, of course, is, and the report on the Kyrgyz Republic said, well, they just put it in, they don't put any budget next to it, and so it doesn't really matter, but they satisfied the donor requ requirements. On 
value chains and food security. Um, there's a lot of different changes. I just want to point out this one case, which I think is really fascinating. It's a case of the kidney bean uh, development in one part of Kyr Kyrgyzstan, okay? And it's really nicely documented. And so what you see is that it started up in the mid-1990s. Now it's really big. And look at the, imp the poverty in that region, which is the... So the blue line is the national poverty level. So this is the last 10 years, roughly. And the orange line is the poverty levels in that region. And you see a really sharp decline, OK, in poverty in the region compared to the national averages. And this is indicating of stunting in the same story there, OK? Basically, the impact of the poverty effect is huge as a consequence of these value chain development. Most of it is exported to Turkey, actually, or through Turkish traders. All right, I'll skip this one because I'm running out of time here. And this is about the potential for future uh, development of grain production, but that's mostly focused on uh, Kazakhstan and Russia and Ukraine. In the report, we have roughly 10 uh, policy recommendations. So I have here in the presentation slides for each one of them, but I'm not going to go through them. Many of them are not surprising, okay? And so it's about strengthening uh, inclusive development, raising awareness of healthy diets, consistency of government progress, meaning if you put something in the law, you have to put a budget next to it or nothing's going to happen, uh, strengthening capacity in a variety of areas, etc. Okay? Maybe the last two are most important for the, let's say, for the IFRI audience because the issue of monitoring policies and assessing the effective impact of these policies is really important and there's very little there. Okay, so this is certainly an area that we can all work in. Thank you very much.